Hi, welcome back to Chemistry in Action. During our last episode, we discussed the subject of mixtures. Today, we will learn about substances we usually encounter in our daily lives. Let's focus on elements and compounds. How important are they to us? How do we distinguish between them? Let's also try to find out how to classify elements and compounds. But before we compound our worries on how to classify substances, let's have a short break. Look around you right now. Can you classify the different forms of matter that you see? Scientists have searched for ways to classify and categorize the things they study. This has led to the classification of matter according to pure substances and mixtures. In the past episode, we saw that mixtures are physical combinations of two or more substances. We also saw how these mixtures can be separated by filtration, extraction, and distillation. If substances form parts of mixtures, this means that they are simpler than mixtures. But what are substances? To make things clearer, let's have Mildred Tamor do a simple experiment with pure water. Can pure water be broken down into different kinds of matter mechanically, say by filtration, extraction, or distillation? Examine the filter. Is there any sediment left? Nothing. Let's then see what happens if we distill another sample of pure water. We use a distilling apparatus. The water boils at a sharp and exact temperature. After all the water has been boiled off, nothing remains. With this experiment, we can see more clearly that pure water is only one substance. It is homogeneous. That is, it is the same kind of matter and has the same properties or distinguishing features throughout the sample. Water is a substance, but can water still be broken down further? Let's ask Mildred to perform another experiment. An electric current is passed through water to which sodium hydroxide has been added. This process is called electrolysis. In this experiment, water has been transformed into two products, hydrogen and oxygen. Unlike the case of mixtures, it needed a chemical process or change to break water down into its components, hydrogen and oxygen. Our question now is, can hydrogen and oxygen be further broken down like water by a chemical change? The answer is no, not by any chemical means, this brings us now to a further grouping of matter. Water is a substance that can be broken down chemically. It is a compound. 
Hydrogen and oxygen are also substances, but they cannot be broken down chemically to form other substances. They are elements. Let's try to tell an element from a compound in another way. Mildred takes a pinch of sulfur and places it in a test tube. As she heats the test tube, the sulfur begins to melt and then turns into yellow vapor. If you look closely, a yellow solid is condensed at the upper portion of the test tube. It is the same color, appearance, and odor as the sulfur before heating. It has not been chemically affected by heat. It has merely undergone a phase change. Now let's see what happens to another kind of sample, say the sugar. If you do this experiment yourself, you will smell a sweet odor coming from the melting sugar. As we continue to apply heat, its color changes. A black residue forms at the bottom of the test tube. At the upper portion, a yellowish liquid appears. Is the black residue still sugar? If we taste it, we find it is no longer sweet. In fact, it tastes quite bitter. This black stuff is no longer sugar, but is now carbon, an element or a substance that cannot be broken down chemically. This yellowish liquid is basically water, which is, as we saw earlier, a compound. Remember that a compound is a substance that can be further broken down chemically. This liquid is yellowish because it is contaminated. Earlier, we saw sulfur undergo a phase change. It did not change into another substance. Its properties remain the same even after heating. If we conducted this experiment, making sure that no sulfur gas escaped, we would find no change in the mass of sulfur. Sulfur cannot be broken down into simpler substances. It is an element. On the other hand, sugar is a compound which can be broken down into simpler substances. Upon heating, it decomposes into carbon and water. What remains in the test tube has a smaller mass than the original sugar sample because some water has escaped as water vapor. It is not always this simple to differentiate between an element and a compound. We do not always get conclusive answers simply by heating. To be certain about our findings, we should conduct other tests. Centuries ago, scientists used heat to differentiate elements from compounds. They concluded that elements do not change into other substances by mere heating. The elements gold, platinum, and silver behave this way. They are not changed into any other substances when heated in the presence of air. However, other results were sometimes misleading. For example, when copper is heated in the presence of air, it gains mass. This is due to the formation of copper oxide as a result of the heating in air. On the other hand, there are some compounds which are not chemically changed when heated. One such compound is salt, sodium chloride. One possible conclusion from all these observations is that elements can either gain mass or remain unchanged when heated. Mass increases when the element combines with oxygen in the air. Compounds either lose mass or remain unchanged when heated. The compound may decompose into other substances, some of which may be gaseous. Let's make a diagram of what we have learned so far. Matter is classified into substances and mixtures. We also grouped substances into elements and compounds. Now stay in your element as we give you a short break.
present, we know of 109 elements. Each one of these is made up of a unique kind of atom. 91 of them are found in nature. The rest are man-made. The periodic table is a ready reference for all students of chemistry. We should always display it in our classrooms. It has the names and symbols of all the chemical elements. Each element has its own symbol. As you can see from these examples, the symbol can be one or two letters. The first letter is always written as a capital letter. In some cases, the symbols are derived from Latin names of the elements. Some elements combine to form biologically important molecules. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are found in carbohydrates, fats, and lipids. In addition to those atoms, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus are also found in proteins and nucleic acids. Water is a combination of an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. About 70% of the human body is water. Our bodies also need other elements and minerals, which we obtain from food. Iodine in seafood, magnesium in nuts, cereals and chocolates, and potassium in fruits and vegetables. Let's now take a look at a few important compounds. Three-fourths of the Earth's surface is covered by water. There is more underground, untapped. Not all of it is accessible for our use. Let us not waste the treated water that does reach us. In general, the properties of a compound are very different from those of the elements that make it up. Let's look at sodium chloride, sodium, and chlorine. Sodium chloride is a colorless crystal. It dissolves in water. The solution has a salty taste, as everyone knows. The element sodium is a solid at room temperature and, since it is a metal, has a typical metallic luster. It is very reactive and explodes in a violent reaction on contact with water. The element chlorine is a greenish yellow gas at room temperature. It has a suffocating odor and is dangerous to inhale. So you see, elements lose their original properties when combined in a compound. They take on a new set of properties entirely their own. We can hardly identify the elements in a compound by simply observing the properties of that compound. This task of finding out the kind and amount of substances in materials belongs to the analytical chemist. Analytical chemists perform quality control analysis and develop new techniques for doing these tests. They tell us when food, water, or pharmaceuticals are safe and good for our health and warn us when these are contaminated and unsafe. Now that we've classified substances, can we also classify elements? Look at these materials. What do they have in common? They are all metals. They all have a metallic luster or shine. They are malleable. That is, they can be reshaped by pounding or by pressure of rollers. Metals are ductile and can be pulled or drawn into wires. They conduct heat and electricity very well. Silver is the best conductor of electricity. It is not used in ordinary electrical wiring because it is extremely expensive. Copper is used instead. Metals are especially important in industry. They can be processed into machines, appliances, containers, and many other things of various shapes and uses. Metals are found on the left side of the periodic table. And then we have the non-metals, like this piece of graphite, a special form of carbon. In contrast to metals, non-metals like this do not have a metallic luster. They are not malleable.
neither are they ductile, they are brittle. Other nonmetals like sulfur are powdery. In addition, unlike metals, most nonmetals do not conduct electricity. We have therefore classified elements into two major groups, metals and nonmetals. How about compounds? How do we classify them? One way of classifying compounds is based on how they react with indicators like these. An indicator is a substance that changes color in solution, depending on whether the solution is acidic or basic. Litmus paper, for example. Here are some substances. Calamansi extract, a colorless soft drink, ammonia, a solution of baking soda. Mildred will help us find out whether these are acids or bases. She puts pieces of red and blue litmus paper on a watch glass. Observe the color of the litmus paper. This is a proper way to apply samples to the litmus paper. Use a steering rod to place a drop of liquid on the litmus paper. Do not drop litmus paper into the test tube. It will contaminate the substance you are testing. Mildred repeats the procedure for all the samples. What color change is observed? This can be the basis for classifying substances. Calamansi extract and the soft drink caused the blue litmus paper to turn red, but did not change the color of the red litmus paper. These are examples of acids. Ammonia and baking soda did not change the color of the blue litmus paper, but they turned the red litmus paper into blue. These are examples of bases. We may also classify compounds based on whether or not they have carbon in them. These types of compounds are all around us as mixtures, like synthetic textiles derived from petroleum, paper from trees and grass. or gasoline. Carbon-containing compounds are called organic compounds. Other materials do not contain any carbon. Water, sand, and stone, for instance. These carbonless substances are called inorganic. Some carbon-containing compounds, though, because of their behavior, behave as inorganic substances. Like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, carbonates, and, if you remember, calcium carbide, the substance that reacted explosively with water. After that explosive experience, let's relax with a short break. half hour, we've seen how matter is classified into mixtures and substances, into elements and compounds. We looked at how elements that make up a compound behave differently from the compounds they form. We discussed how elements can be classified into metals and non-metals. We made operational groupings of substances into acids and bases and also into organic and inorganic substances. I hope that with today's episode, you will further sharpen your students' process skills in observing, comparing, classifying, and inferring. 
I trust that what you learned today was, well, substantial. Until next episode on Faces of Matter, this is Ramon Miranda saying, see you. <laughs>